This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Jeremy here, and I'm very excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Today's guest has put it all on the line for liberty. A lieutenant general in the United States Army and former national security advisor, he was persecuted by the FBI and the DOJ, later vindicated. He is a true American hero for standing up for what he knows to be right and true. Welcome to the show, General Michael Flynn. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate you having me on. And and your audience, and we'll have some fun, you know, we'll have some serious discussion today, and also uh, maybe hopefully, hopefully inspire people to do something, you know, I tell people now that I think for where we are as a nation, I think all of us have to find a new purpose in life, you know, and so I mm-hmm. think if, if you look back at your young life, and you look back a couple of years ago, you know, where you are today, and what you've achieved, you'd have never thought that you'd be where you're at, probably, you know, same here, yeah. same with me. So anyway, I'm looking forward to uh, to having a, a good conversation with you and your audience. I want to ask first and foremost, I know people aren't really quite, you know, some are familiar with these stories, some aren't, but there's been a very hard push from intelligence agencies, from the Department of Justice, from all these different areas to, for some reason, really keep you not in a position of power and keep you quiet. And I guess the thing that I've always been very curious about is, why are they so afraid of you, General Flynn? Like, what makes these different agencies so afraid to have you in a position where you can actually do something? Yeah. Well, it's really not a $64,000 question. I mean, it's when you think about my career, my military career, and my career in the intelligence community, you don't get to uh, where I got, you know, one, because you're stupid, two, because you're crazy, like they've tried to say about me. I know that uh, having run one of the largest intel agencies in the world, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and and having been the most senior uh, intelligence officer in the United States military at one time, and then having achieved the level of national security advisor to a duly elected president, you don't get there because, you know, by happen chance or by luck. Mm -hmm. You, You know, you get there because you've worked hard. You have proven yourself, frankly, over and over and over again. And so to answer your specific question, sort of why, because I do know how these organizations function. I know how they operate. I know why they do many of the things that they do. And all of a sudden, when I was you know, put into the role of national security advisor, I am now going to be essentially at the right hand of the president of the United States, and I will have not just influence, but direction and authority uh, over those organizations to be able to dig into them, to be able to, uh, you know, refine them, I guess. I'll use that word sort of lightly, to be able to change or affect the culture of those organizations, and in some cases to close some down, some of these organizations down. So they knew that. I mean, I understand I understand the bureaucracy. I understand the people. I understand the organizations. I understand the budgets, especially the budgets. I understand the, the personalities. And, and I understand how and why uh, these organizations are able to usurp uh, duly elected officials. And mm-hmm. I understand how they are able to kind of work around. So, you, you know, usurping means basically undercutting. In many cases, right. they just work around you know, the elected officials in our constitutional republic. And they don't care. They don't care. The other thing that's part of this, once when 9-11 occurred, you know, and this, we can go back to, you know, the 1950s, if you want. But when 9-11 occurred, the, the explosion or the explosive effect, you know, sort of the, the metaphorical explosive effect that happened inside of the federal government was that it grew by, in some cases, five times that it was mm-hmm. on the 10th of September of 2001, Jeremy. 
five mm -hmm. times. So if you were an organization that had 3,000 people in your agency activity or department on the 10th of September of 2001, 10 years later, you had 15,000 people. OK, you had 15,000 people or in some cases, maybe even 20,000. So the entirety of the federal government grew. And once it grew, it started to get to the point of being totally out of control, even as recent as what we're seeing with with the FBI and what, what we're learning about the FBI. The FBI clearly, clearly, they undercut the presidential election for 2020. There's no there's factual now. And it looks like they even had. Uh, some role in uh, undercutting the 2022 election, at least through information that they had where they were helping one side versus what they should have been doing, which is basically remaining in an unbiased role. So that's just one example of an FBI that's gone totally out of control. That is sort of what the rest of the government, that has happened across the government, but particularly in the areas of the justice system, areas of what I would call the rule of law organizations, because there are many, right? The rule of law is not just in the DOJ and the FBI. It's in all of these different departments and agencies and activities. You know, the, the IRS has its own federal law enforcement arm, uh, you know, the Marshal Service, you know, et cetera, every one of them, the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, they all have their own arms of law of justice, right? That's one side of it. The other is that they also are doing it without you know, it's kind of like the I'll just wait out a president of the United States because they only are going to be there for four years. So the so the bureaucrats and then those people that flow like the tide, they flow in and out of government. So mm -hmm. if you're like a if you're a senior executive in the U.S. government, meaning you're a bureaucrat, so you're a senior executive service in the, in the government and one a new administration comes in, you flow out. And you go off to work with one of the big contractors. So the contractors are part of this undercutting of the government because they, they want to keep the contracts flowing. They want to keep all the money flowing. And then once a new administration comes back in, another one comes back in, let's say you know the Biden administration comes in. So then those people flow back in. And instead of flowing back in as a senior executive bureaucrat, they flow in as an assistant secretary, an undersecretary, a deputy assistant secretary, a, a deputy undersecretary, or some in some capacity in the government where they actually have more power. And so that's kind of where we stand today. And we have a lot of that. And that's been going on. It's been going on in droves. I mean, the numbers have been exponentially growing, frankly, since 9-11. And then the Patriot Act, I want to bring in this thing called the Patriot Act, which happened right after 9-11. The Patriot Act is really where there's been a lot of advantage taken by by the Department of Justice on the Patriot Act, the FISA, FISA abuse and such that we've seen, particularly in my case or Carter Page's or certainly uh, President Trump's. So that Patriot Act allowed the government to switch from essentially, and certainly parts of the government, like the CIA and others, to switch from mainly focused on, on adversaries overseas to starting to focus on people right here at home. And yes. initially... I would sit there and I would say, OK, if we have terrorists who are in this country, who are inside of our domestic, our contiguous borders, like we did with the 9-11 hijackers, you know, if we have terrorists inside of our borders, we need to be able to find them. And we need to be able to find those people that are working with them. But what happened is the abuse of the system, because the system is filled with people who can be corrupted, who can be paid off, who can be li literally, I mean, literally paid off who can be given positions of authority and power, you know, for the purpose of taking care of a political entity. And so over time, that abuse of the Patriot Act started to turn on not just, you know, what should be home, you know, terrorists inside of our country that are operating to destroy, you know, the fabric of our society, but actually it started to go after regular old American citizens. And then it really started to go after political parties, right? And in this case, because of who controls it, right? Who controls it and, and who controls it? And this is, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox on this, uh, Jeremy. Who controls it is that, in, most people don't realize this, the growth of the Democratic Socialist Party of America, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Communist Party of America, has exponentially grown inside of the U.S. government. So we have a lot of card-carrying members who are socialists that operate and work inside of our government. 
and frankly function around the peripheries of Washington, D.C. in uh, much of the other aspects, the other, the sort of the shoreline, the shoreline, if you will, of the deep state, right? Mm -hmm. If the swamp is, if the swamp is the people in there, you know, uh, doing their dirty work, you know, there's a shoreline that enables them and gives them their riches and their wealth and their sort of unelected authority to be able to do things because, frankly, because they can. And when you mm -hmm. don't have, when you don't have the guts that we need in Congress, I'm starting to like this guy, James Comer, right? I'm starting to like uh, Congressman Comer. Because, you know, he's, he does seem like he's got the guts to, to go and do the right things. But now we're going to wait and see if his compadres in the, uh, in the House of Representatives have the guts, mainly now, now I'm talking about Speaker McCarthy, if they have the guts to do the right thing and start impeach these people. If they have mm -hmm. an impeachment ability, then look what they did to Trump over nothing. Yeah. And then the other authority that they have is the purse strings, purse strings. So that's... From an American perspective and from the, from a, you know, just as a citizen, knowing what I know about how our government, you know, could function, the, the House right now, House of Representatives has authorities that they can actually take and then put pressure on the, on the executive branch of the government, certainly. And then, of course, you know, maybe, maybe we'll uh, talk about other aspects of authority that people need to have in this country, mainly governors, because governors are doing nothing right now. Well, General, I think the thing that's interesting is, is you mentioned kind of these communists on the, the periphery. And, and I think that is the bigger thing that we should be paying attention to, because we look at like, you know, what's happening in the, the perceived culture war and things like we have that around right now. And if you look at kind of what's happened, I guess, in, in China over the last 40 years, if you look at like uh, what Zbigniew Brzezinski and, and guys like Henry Kissinger would the, help to create technocracy over there. And now they're trying to create a very similar version of that here with a very Chinese form of communism. And I think people are totally missing that. Like, they're totally missing that and they're going after the wrong target. And I think in, unless we figure out how to handle that problem, it's going to get worse because you look at how the World Economic Forum and, and groups like this are trying to create these super national types of orders, even what the WHO just said about vaccine passports. So unless we figure out how to handle this, it's going very quickly. And I guess looking at that what do we do about this then? Because this seems like a really big yeah. problem that's gotten pretty far down the road. Yeah, and, you know, I think people in the country right now are surprised at how fast this seems to be moving, right? And, but it's at the end, okay? So at the end of the Athenian Empire, it suddenly collapsed on itself. And it mm -hmm. collapsed pretty quickly, and it dissipated into really, uh, I would just call them families or using an Irish term, clans, right? I mean, and that's kind of what happened. And the Athenian Empire was, you know, in general, it was overextended. It had massive debt. It had gone well past what empire it could actually control. It had, its military began to really fall apart. And the Athenian Empire was always a big naval empire, but they had strong, you know, army type forces as well. So, you know, the United States right now, we're, we have, you know, we have massive debt, right? And that's how you drive a country into the ground, right? You pervert its culture, which they're doing. You, you increase and you raise and you cause massive, massive debt. You take over institutions of government. You move away from this whole idea about that a God exists and government becomes God, I mean, you know, whatever people want to believe, that's the way communism, that's what communism is all about. We forget that there's other ideologies on the planet that are adversarial to our ideology of democracy, a constitutional republic and capitalism, right? And our way of life where we like, where we cherish our freedoms. I, you know, I'm one of these people, it's like, you know, I, I said to somebody that was a, I spoke to a, a gay man the other day and uh, who told me, you know, we had a conversation and he told me that, you know, so, and I believed him and he was kind of quizzing me on some things. And I said, you know what, if I was a gay man, I'd be upset at the transgender movement because it's sort of usurping the whole idea about the LGB community. So, mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, I mean, what people's behavior is, whether I like it or not, in a free country, in a free society, you know, that should not matter it's just don't shove it down my throat, right? Don't yes. tell me that I have to accept something 
And if I don't accept something, then I'm a racist, I'm a homophobe, I'm, you know, every, I'm a white nationalist, whatever the hell, you know, word that they, that they want to use to describe me. And I said, you know, I was in the military in the, you know, for a long time that I was in the military in the days of uh, don't ask, don't tell, right? Don't ask, mm -hmm. don't tell. And you know what the military did? We said, okay, no problem. And, and we saluted and, you know, it's like, and I talk about this because this is the idea of America. And I will tell you, in communist societies, you know, I can tell you specifically in China, if you were to come out and say, you know, I'm a gay man or I'm a transgender, I'm a, a man and I want to become a woman or I'm a woman, and I want to become a man. The Chinese will cut your head off. They will not allow that to happen because they don't want that kind of attitude. They want this monolithic, you know, God is government or government is God society. So I, you know, I, I went down that path with you and it wasn't a path that I thought I was going to go down. But sure. to me, we have to figure out the speed and we have to try to, you know, slow this speed down because the momentum is not necessarily in our favor right now because all of the levers of power seem to be controlled by the left, right? And I say the left, is, it's not the Democrat Party. I, you know, I was a lifelong Democrat, you know, right? So well, I think uh, I just, the Democratic uh, Party now is not what the Democratic Party once was, right? I think the political alignment yeah, no, right now is very strange. Yeah, it doesn't exist. The Democrat Party doesn't exist. It's been completely taken over by the left and by the socialist movement in this country. So let's talk about the globalist, the globalist elites, right? The World Economic Forum, I think you mentioned. And, yes. you know, that's currently headed up by Klaus Schwab. You know, you mentioned people like Brzezinski and Kissinger. You know, Kissinger, interestingly enough, it, I, I actually think, if you know, Kissinger did a lot of interesting things, okay, for in different roles. And, you know, he gets a big, nobody will say nasty things about Henry Kissinger. I've met him a couple of times, had great conversations with him. And I tried to take, like I learned when I was a young officer, take all the good and take all the bad, leave the bad behind and just take the good with you as you go forward in life. Right. So, sure. you know, I had interesting conversations with him and, and, you know, I'd venture to say that if people really looked at what uh, Henry Kissinger did after his government service, did he do business or did he work for or advise countries like Russia and countries like China on uh, maybe on behalf of the United States government, maybe on behalf of himself. So I know and Brzezinski's, in, you know, in there as well. And there, you know, people are going to go, oh, my God, Flynn, you know. But, you know, I think we need to look at these people that got us to where we are today. Right. Because this is starting, you know, this is 40, 50 years ago, right in the 70s. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's that? 50 years, I think now. Oh, my God, 50 yeah. years. So. It seems like, you know, that's twice your age. So, Well, I, I mean, turned 36 last week, and my parents are kind of freaked out because now they feel old. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, uh, you know, I think that, number one, we have to take what they say very seriously. So when you, you know, when you listen to the World Economic Forum, when you listen to Klaus Schwab, when you listen to Bill Gates, when you listen to people like Obama, when you listen to... This key advisor, Yuval Noah Harari, when you read some of the executive orders that are coming out of our White House right now, you know, Executive Order 14067, you know, I'll say it again, Executive Order 14067, it has to do with central bank digital currency. We're already well on the way to having a new type of currency where the dollar is not going to be the currency of choice for, for global trade around the world anymore if, if we're not careful. And this administration is not being, it's not that they're not being careful. They're being very intentional to move us away from what we have had for so long. You know, one of the negatives of a guy like Richard Nixon, when he was president, he took us off the gold standard, right? I mean, he had some, he had a lot of positive things that he did, but he took us off the gold standard and Kissinger was around at that time. You got to kind of go back and you really got to look at the, the history and the decision making at that time for that reason. Because here we are 50 years later, and now it's looking like the goal that the return of gold, the return of silver, the return of precious metals is becoming an even, it's going to become a really hot commodity. In fact, if you follow the gold and silver markets right now, it, you know, everything's going up because there's a demand, right? When demand goes up, prices go up. So sure. we're going to see a shift in our uh, economy. My guess is probably by the end of this summer, because all you have to do is pay attention to what the White House is saying and what the economic advisors 
of the White House are saying. And some of the markets that are, when you're looking at the markets and the direction that it's, that's going to change everybody's life. It's going to change every American's life. Because if we move to a, uh, like a Chinese version of a social credit score, then, you know, and I'm trying to find a, a credit card, right? So, you know, and you get a, you know, you take a credit card, right? And that credit card then is dictated about by the government as to how much money you're able to spend every month. Mm -hmm. And remember, equity is not about everybody having an equal opportunity to rise to your maximum potential. Equity is about sharing everything that you have with others, okay? Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you're going to have an, an equitable society, that means that's a polite way of using a communist term of everybody's going to share everything, right? And we're going to, mm -hmm. so that means if I make, if I work my tail off and I make a lot of money and I typically fill up my gas tank twice a month, well, the government might come in and go, well, sorry, when you go to fill that gas tank up a second time, they're going to stop your credit card from being able to do that because your credit score, your social credit score doesn't look too good for the environment, right? Because you're using mm -hmm. too much of a fossil fuel. So they're not going to let you put more gas into your car twice a month, you know, with your credit card. They're going to basically, you're going to put it in and all of a sudden it's going to say either no pay due or, or see your, you know, call your banker or whatever, right? And, and That's the same can, thing, General, that scares me about Neuralink, too. Like, I, my wife and I were listening to RFK and Elon Musk's Twitter space session. My wife's name is Brielle. And, and I said, you know, like, th this could be the situation of, well, Brielle, we don't agree with what you did today. So we're actually going to shut off your Neuralink and you can't do anything else. Like, these levers of control that are coming in along with, you know, what you're talking about with a social credit score on cards. Like, it's a scary thing of how quickly we can lose these freedoms. Yeah, so, and I'm glad that you guys, especially as young people, were listening because I think you're, I'm going to continue to fight, uh, you know, you, I'm going to use my experience that I've been given over my lifetime and try to, as much as I can, uh, get people to understand historically the historical reality that we face because nation states rise and fall. I mentioned Athens earlier. That's a fact mm -hmm. of life. So is the United States of America in a place where we are ebbing, right, and flowing out with the tide, not going to continue to be this constitutional republic that has existed for essentially, you know, let's just say 250 years. So that, this idea of Neuralink, there are already not just tests, there's already, you know, there's actual human tests being done right now with these little chips that are put into the skin. MIT actually does it, and it's called, I think it's called the quant, the quant. It's a, it's a little chip that goes underneath your skin, and basically, you know, there's already tests about people doing a, kind of having a, a digital code in your hand, and you swap it at, the, at a store, probably not Target these days, but you swap, you know, you <laughs> run it over a store, and you're able to buy, you're able to purchase, you know, your, your stuff. Well, how do they know that? That means that they know exactly how much money you have in your account, and they know how much money they they being the government, this globalist elite, very small globalist elite that wants to run the world based on how they see the world, that how the world should be run based on their ideas, right? Not, not mm -hmm. the idea of freedom. So it's moved very rapidly, uh, Jeremy. And I think that the idea of Neuralink, you know, Harari, you all know Harari, the World Economic Forum, you know, principal advisor to people like Schwab and Gates and Obama. He's already said, he's already publicly said, and he said this probably only two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, where he said that the 2024 election in the United States of America, he's not a U.S. citizen, so he's talking about the 2024 election will be run by AI. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean that, so if he says that, and he's saying that to a lot of people around this country, right? This guy has a big, big audience because the mainstream media gives it to him. The globalist elite give it to him. And so if he's saying that our, our 2024 election is going to be run by AI, well, who's inputting the information into the AI, into the intelligence systems to be able to get an expected outcome? If it's people like him, you know, then implied is why the hell should we have a, an election? Because somebody else is going to decide it, meaning it's a selection. Well, I actually think mm -hmm. that around the world, we've seen governments be selected. I actually think that our government right now, you know, to a degree, because I, I, 
I have every right, at least the way our government functions now and our Constitution functions now and our First Amendment functions right now, I have every right to be able to say that I don't believe that the outcome of our 2020 election was fair. And in fact, mm -hmm. we have 60 to 65 percent on still. I mean, even a recent poll, I forget which one, but it's a very recent poll. We're like 65 percent of the people don't believe that the person in the White House uh, won the 2020 election. Never mind, you know, 2022 and, and going into 2024. So, you know, we're doing our part to raise our voice. And basically the, the purpose is to save America, because mm -hmm. if we don't, and this is why I use the phrase uh, local action equals a national impact or local action has a national impact. I love when I see these uh, moms, particularly moms, these women getting involved in their communities because they're bravely, courageously trying to help their children grow up in a school system that's not teaching, you know, how to be a drag queen, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is insane. This is insane. I mean, come on. So we have got to get back to a normalcy. When I, and I say that a little bit, a little bit tongue in cheek, but not, and not facetiously, not jokingly, when I say get back, because I am not about going backwards in time. I am all about going forwards in time. I'm all about uh, leveraging technology. I'm all about innovation. I'm all about creativity. I'm all about allowing people to live the way they want to live as long as they don't, as long as they don't force me to accept something that I don't accept. I just, you know, live and let live, right? That's a beautiful phrase, live and let live. We haven't really gotten into the, into the wars yet or foreign policy because I do want to talk about a little bit about war because war is not only a distraction, it's also a moneymaker, right? It's a big moneymaker. It's a racket. War is a racket. But country right now, we have so many domestic problems, so many domestic problems. And what I want people to do is I want people to realize that, that those problems aren't going to be solved in Washington, D.C. Talking to you from the state of Florida. So they're not going to be solved in Tallahassee. They're not going to be solved by Governor DeSantis because now he's off running for president, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. why is he doing that? And, but other, there's a lot of other governors because I do want to mention governors. Governors have extraordinary authority and power from the Constitution. I mean, the state's rights component that were given to what are the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is a fascinating amendment, you know. It basically gives governors and it gives people, gives us authority, but it does it at the state level. I mean, governors have extraordinary authority. And not one governor, not one, not one governor, even though 60, I think it's 60 or 65 percent of the country believes that the 2020 election uh, wasn't done fairly. So where are the governors to say, you know, maybe just a little bit, maybe we had a little bit of fraud in 2020. Because when I look at the person running our country, you know, I feel for him. I get angry at his family for essentially causing a, a man that should be sitting on a rocking chair on his back porch, right? This episode is sponsored by My Pillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York, on a ski vacation, and uh, I actually have an extra My Pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting. And uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, <clears throat> you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% off select products at MyPillow.com. Up to 66% off select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the MyPillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And, uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So if you guys want to join me on the parasite cleanse and, uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with, <clears throat> you can head over to brave tv.store slash CYOL um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. Well, even just falling on stage the other day, like that doesn't inspire confidence in the country and also on the world stage, right? It's at the Air Force Academy. I mean, maybe if it was like, you know, a 
at the University of Pennsylvania and he fell on stage, it wouldn't be such a big deal, but he fell on stage at the United States Air Force Academy, the home historic bastion of leadership training and confidence building and our need to inspire young people who are going to put their lives on the line for our country. He blames it on a sandbag. We're being sandbagged. We're yes. being sandbagged, okay? So stop it within the White House. Stop it within, but they're not. So the other thing that I know is that they're not going to wake up tomorrow, Jeremy. And this is why you're, you're really an important part of expanding our voices to save America, right? Expand our voice, you know, save America, because that's what we really are all about. You're an important part because... You, you're a young man, you touch an audience that needs to hear, you know, frankly, they need to hear this kind of stuff. They need to hear sort of the right. unvarnished, you know, and people can, can go check on whatever I say, uh, but I absolutely believe what I'm saying. I believe it. So mm -hmm. tomorrow, tomorrow, they're not going, you know, they, the White House and, the, and those in uh, power, they're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know what, we've been screwing the American people you know, so badly, we're going to change everything. We're going to open up the energy spigots. We're going to shut down the Department of Education. We're going to get rid of all this transgenderism. We're going to we're going to make sure that our military is prepared to fight and win our nation's wars. We're going to get rid of all of this CRT training that we're forcing down their throats. And we're going to basically we're going to close our borders. We're going to reduce crime. We're going to fund our police. You know, I mean, they're not going to do that. The whole idea about Build Back Better, so remember, Build Back Better was Joe Biden's bumper sticker running for, for president, right? When he would have, you know, six or seven people in little white circles at his campaign rallies, right? And he would talk about Build Back Better. Well, you don't see anybody wearing Build Back Better baseball hats around the country. And number mm -hmm. one, Build Back Better as a bumper sticker has been around for a long time. He's not the one that- It was in the World they, Economic Forum. Yeah, they brought that bumper sticker into the Democrat- machine to use it. And really what Build Back Better means, this gets to my point about they're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and, and suddenly fix everything or change everything and, and realize that they've been screwing the American people. Their version or their idea of Build Back Better is to destroy everything, to destroy the very institutions that we have in our country, particularly this idea of our Constitution, destroy it and then build it back better in their image. And their image is this globalist elite image of one of a new world order with globalist institutions like the United Nations, World Health Organization, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund. These are all globalist uh, institutions with unelected bureaucrats running them. Some of these bureaucrats are hardcore Marxists that are in charge of these things. And when you start to see like the World Health Organization, I think it was the last 24 hours, but they've been talking about it for a while. They just came out with another like dictum, they come out with another, you know, directive that basically says, if you don't follow what we're telling you, we're going to shut you down. We're going to, you know, and, and, and um, they adopted the EU's vaccine yeah. passport policy. Yeah, it's that. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a uh, it's unbelievable what, what they're coming out with. And people need to understand this. You know, they need to understand it. The uh, in fact, I'll give you the title here, because I think people, need to know, you know, one, the title of the article, it just came out this morning. It's Pandemic Treaty. Pandemic Treaty. Okay, mm. So a treaty means that we have to abide by it. And if we sign off on it, and it looks like we probably are, you know, uh, Dr. Tedros, right, uh, told members that the threat of another pathogen emerging with even deadlier potential remains, right? Essentially, we're one step closer to control over global health emergencies. So mm. if the World Health Organization comes out and says, we are going to have another global health emergency, or we are in the midst of a global health emergency. Here's all of the things that we must do. And that means shut things down, right? We go back to the ways of, you know, of our COVID days, right? So anyway, I just think that uh, we have to understand this. And I want your audience to understand this. I want all young people to understand it because, you know, I'm an older guy, right? I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm older, I'm twice as old as you. But I'm in a place where I could be like, you know, I, I served my country, right? I served in the military. I loved being in the military. I went back into government thinking that I was going to help the country. You know, I got totally screwed by some really evil people. They're still there. 
and they have had, there's been no accountability yet. And they, they'll, you know, I always tell people, you know, I'll meet them at the gates of hell. That's where we're going to have accountability. And maybe that's where it'll be because I do, and I don't wear it on my sleeve, but I do believe in my faith. And uh, eventually, you know, eventually God wins. So whatever people want to believe, that's fine. That's what I believe. So I think going forward, these guys could come in and say, there's another world pandemic. They could name it with some alphabet soup that nobody would understand. <laughs> and they would come in and go, and they would come in and say, the following conditions must happen. And then people mm -hmm. would go, oh, my God, you know. And then the media would jump on board. The globalist institutions would jump on board. The government, our government that controls a lot of levers of power, could jump on board. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to feel like we're being forced to do something. And you're looking around going, well, wait a second, I'm not sick. There's nothing wrong with me. And I'm damn sure I'm not going to take another jab in my arm that that does have things in it. You, know, you mentioned, I think you had Peter McCullough on your show at one time, you know? Yes. I mean, so, so look at what we've learned about the jabs, right? Because it's not a vaccine. It's not a vaccine. And even, even the so media recently it. has started to turn against it too, which is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good thing. But, you know, I think, I think a lot of people, and I heard this the other day, I heard this the other day, and I won't use the, I won't talk to the institutions, but these institutions know who they are. You know, that there was a, what kid, now maybe, you know, you're a really good kid, and you, and I apologize for calling you a kid, but you're a kid to me. You, you, <laughs> did you ever, now tell me the truth, did you ever have a, a fake ID to get into a liquor store to buy beer before you were eligible, or yes or no? No, I, I actually didn't. I had a super, super closed off Christian upbringing. <laughs> Well, that's okay. That's good. that's good. I mean, you know, I have to admit that there was a time in my life where I was a young radical and I did things and I got caught and I got caught and yeah. I learned. I learned from those lessons. But now what we know and what I was told the other day by people that know this in certain parts of our nation, certain institutions, they were using fake IDs, vax, like vax cards, right? So you could get mm -hmm. on the, so you could go into some place or you could go visit somebody or you could go do your job so you had to show your vax id card right well those vax id cards were fake and they were given because the people that had them were told don't get that jab because it, what i'm being told is it's not good for you so and when i look at that i'm like you know to me that's bad that's a really bad thing and if that's the case and people that have that fake card are out there you know, espousing to take, you know, get the vaccine, get, wear the mask, do all these things. I'm like, well, wait a second. So you actually took the vaccine? You actually took the jab? And you took all five? I mean, you know, flu requires somebody to take five shots in less than a year. That's insane. Mm -hmm. And obviously they don't work because we've learned that, right? We've learned that now. So so anyway, you know, I don't want to get down that, that rabbit hole right now because, you know, you can have other guests who really know their business when it comes to the science of this thing. but. Well, I do want to get into the idea of war because you, you kind of referenced that briefly. It is kind of interesting the world we're living in now, General, because I feel like we, the way that they need to control is by having a war that never ends, right? So like they ended the previous yeah. one and they've kind of brought in this next one, what's happening in Ukraine. And we don't know who's winning. We don't know who's losing. It depends on what the media wants to tell us today. And, and you've also, you know, written extensively about modern warfare and where it's going. Um, you know, with a, with a book you had come out called The Citizen's Guide to Fifth Generation Warfare. So I guess what do we need to know about fifth generation warfare and, and really what does that mean? Yeah, so first of all, uh, wars are very, very costly. And a political war like we are, have in uh, Eastern Europe right now, the cost can be the actual uh, destruction of a nation. So uh, a political war, which which is really all war for us. Mm -hmm. Politics, the failure of politics is what causes war. So the cost of a political war uh, can cost our nation everything we have, and it's we're in really bad shape right now. Um, the more protracted a war is, the resources of the state then get consumed, and they get consumed rapidly. And the state has to then, you know, sort of regurgitate or remake itself and get into, you know, you got to have the manufacturing prowess. You, you've got to have the weapon systems to be able to, to refill your stocks. You got to have the wealth to be able to, to continue with these protracted wars. And since, since World War II, really, we have been in protracted wars that we have not 
won yet. Mm-hmm. So since World War II, okay, the Korean War, if you talk to the Koreans, that war, that war hasn't ended. It's not ended. They're still, you know, North Korea is still at war. When you, and people will go, well, you know, the Gulf War we won. That was a battle. That was a 100-hour battle. And then we had to go back to Iraq, mm-hmm. right? And we went back to Iraq for the wrong reasons, for a lie, based on a lie. So let's just take recent history. So the government has lied to us about, about Russiagate. They've lied to us about everything. They've lied to us about COVID. They've lied to us about damn near everything that we, that we believe and we seek for our eyes to know to be true. So is what we're seeing in Ukraine right now one big lie? And I, I think that we're, you know, I wrote an article a while ago about, this is back in uh, probably 20 years ago, basically that we, have, we get an A for participating in wars. We get an F mm-hmm. for winning wars. And so if you're going to go to war and you don't have an objective, a clear objective to win the war, then you're, you're going to be in a protracted war. And the only people that that benefits is the, you know, I say war is a racket, are those that are benefiting from the war. Maybe it's some politicians, certainly, because they're going to be putting money into their pockets. It's definitely the military industrial complex. And now we have this security state complex, which is part of this whole fifth generation warfare, right? So 5GW, you know, it's really, it's really fascinating. I mean, I say, and I'll rattle through a couple of things here. First generation warfare is pre-gunpowder. Second generation warfare introduced the aspects of weapons that use gunpowder, right? I mean, just when they discovered gunpowder, so they started to develop, you know, tools to be able to blow things up. Third generation warfare incorporated flying machines, tanks, trench warfare, rockets, and long range artillery. I mean, when you think about World War One, you see some old flick about some old movie flick about World War One, the trench warfare, and the guys coming over the trenches and the long range artillery, and and you had the, you know, you had the different airplanes, and you had tanks get introduced during World War One. Fourth generation warfare is really the introduction of atomic and nuclear weapons. Okay, mm-hmm. so now we fast forward to where we are today in fifth generation warfare. And fifth generation warfare is directed at societies to affect what I call, uh, what we call in the book, the cognitive battle space. It's the belief system of civilians. And this book, this book is not called the military guide or the soldier's guide. It's called the citizen's guide. And it's written by two professionals, myself and Sergeant Retired Boone Cutler. And it's written in really layman's language. It's written for just citizens. And frankly, we have it selling overseas now. It's, in, it's about to come out in Hispanic. It's going to come out in German. It's going to come out in Dutch. And we're working on a, a Japanese uh, language version of it as well. Because it's not just, I mean, we wrote it for America. Because I want people in America to understand what it is that we're facing. Mm-hmm. But it's actually for anybody who loves freedom. And it's for anybody who, who wants to understand how easy it is to manipulate your mind and to, and to use things like propaganda, right? The, the Nazis were experts. The thing that came to mind for me, General, is when you were talking about this, the quote from 1984, well, we've always been at war with Eurasia. Those wars, like besides being profitable, they're a very good control tool, right? Because we do things during time of war that we wouldn't typically do, right? And I think that's really important to remember as well. Yeah, I mean, fifth generation warfare is really designed to affect your emotions and your motives. And, you know, to a degree, you know, someone like me, I got a lot of life experience, right? I have, and I've been blessed to have my life experience, not only growing up in a big family, but also having a great family of my own, but also having the experience of serving in our armed forces and serving overseas and you know, I've been on six continents. I've been in, on battlefields. I have risen to the highest levels of the government, certainly of the military and our government, having served as a, you know, as director of DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and also as a national security advisor to the government. So I feel very blessed to, to have this set of life experiences. Those people that don't have that kind of set of life experiences and those that are younger are more vulnerable and they're targeted. So mm-hmm. the left, the Marxist movement in the country and the communist movement globally, because remember, the larger, you know, I mean, China has like 1.6 billion people, right? You add in Russia, you add in the alliance. And like I say, there's a global alliance that's formed against the United States of America. And uh, that global alliance, it consists of about, you know, 
At one time, I thought it was only about 45% of the world's population. Now it's upwards of about 75% of the world population. So, wow. And I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, when you hear the White House go, the, you know, the world is against Russia. You know, the, the sanctions are working. Well, wait a second. You know, the BRICS nations alone, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they're all aligned in one particular alliance, particularly an economic alliance. And then you add in another 10 countries that I could tick off, you know, the Saudis being one of them, which used to be, you know, totally, you know, they would do, they would be our great partners there in the Middle East. They're now aligned with China. They're working with China to to basically work different deals and also changing the global currency. France is another one. So all mm -hmm. of these countries, when you hear the administration basically lie about the sanctions are working, they're not working because we're looking at we're looking at upwards of about 75% of the global population is starting to form an alliance against the United States of America. And that mm -hmm. what is also happening though, and this is on the positive side because I don't want to be I want to be totally negative about where we are, but that's the reality. But on the positive side, there are nations that don't like this idea of this global system, this new world order, right? So there's probably a dozen to 15 nation states right now that are fighting back and trying to protect their own sovereignty. And actually, we are. We're doing it right now. The United States of America is doing it, but we're doing it through we the people. Okay, It's we mm -hmm. the people that are fighting back. It's not our government because our government is bought into this new world order. They're trying to run the country by uh, executive order edict, okay? We're run, and I we're think that's it. really dangerous. That's something that we've talked about repeatedly on this show. Like, you know, like even if you look at the number of executive orders under Bush and under even under Trump and under different presidents, like it's dangerous to shift that much power to the executive branch because we are, really get so far away from the three equal powers of government then. Yeah, so, I mean, you're right. You're 100% right. And I guess I... One of my, um, the sentiment that I have about our Constitution is that I really want the justices within the judiciary branch of our government, right, the, the three party, the three uh, legs of our, of our country, of our Constitution, right, judiciary, legislative, and executive. I want the judiciary to wield the power that comes with the Constitution specifically the United States Supreme Court. So the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roberts, right now, they have extraordinary authority and power to be able to reach into the judicial system and pull cases up that might have such a constitutional impact on the country. And right now, mm -hmm. the Chief or the Justices of our Supreme Court, they can't sit there and tell me that they don't see what's happening to our country and yes. say, this is, this is okay. I mean, if they do, they don't deserve to be justices on the Supreme Court. If they, if they don't see what's happening to, our, to the fabric of our society, to the fabric of our Constitution. So, you know, my prayers go out to the justices in our Supreme Court and these other judges that are within our judiciary to really look at things and do things based on the law. And, you know, mm -hmm. instead of having like when somebody goes, well, which judge do you have? And they go, well, it's, it's a, uh, a Clinton appointed judge or it's an Obama appointed judge or it's a Trump appointed judge or it's a Bush appointed judge. You know, I wish that we weren't there. I wish yes. that we weren't there because what that does is that taints the rule of law in this country in a really, really ugly way. And I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it partly because and in a very specific example I can say that because I was abused by a federal judge, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, Washington, D.C., Federal Circuit Court. Totally abused. Never in the history of the country. Never. Okay, so here's some breaking news for you. Never in the history of the country was a person who was, whose case was dismissed was then abused by a federal judge like I was abused for almost another eight months. Never mm -hmm. in the history of this country. So you're looking at somebody who had to talk about withstanding an ungodly test. But I want our judiciary to understand that the fabric of our Constitution is fragile and they have a responsibility, just like legislatures do, to control purse strings, to set, to create laws, and just like the executive branch does to essentially provide our safety and security as a nation. 
right? And I don't feel like any of that's happening right now. I feel like it's all like, it's just, it's like, it's all that sort of seems to be like, talk about fragile, it seems to be very mm -hmm. fragile. So anyway, I just, you know, I, I want, I don't want us to be dull. I don't want people, I don't want your audience to walk away from it. I want your audience to walk into it. Okay. Well, I, want... I guess looking at that then, like, I guess what advice I know, because we are running low on time and make sure I value your time. But like for people watching this, I think you mentioned for the audience and I think people can feel so powerless, right? They observe all these things happening. They they see what's happening to you to happen to you. They see what's happened to President Trump. They see what's happened in 2020. They can feel so powerless. I guess like what would you tell them that they can actually do like that they can do moving forward from here? Yeah, I mean, I think that like I say, the phrase local action equals a national impact. I have a national and international platform, and I'm blessed to have that. And I try to use it. I try to be very honest and very authentic about what I believe. And people can take it for what it's worth. They can, you know, I mean, the media, I, I, get, I get attacked relentlessly for, for being so out there, I guess. But I want people to understand that at this point in time in our nation's history, everybody has to find a new purpose in their lives for what it is that they can do. People yeah. have skills and they have talents and most of all, they have potential. And I think now is the time for people to not sit there on their laurels and go, ah, you know, I, I don't know, I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. I work hard and I got to take care of my family and I all for that. But you have to decide what your purpose in life will be going forward from here on out. Meaning, you know, do you get involved in some local political club, right? Or do you get, do you volunteer to be a, a precinct volunteer? Uh, you know, there's the precinctstrategy.com, right? Steve Stern, precinctstrategy.com. Go look it up. There's a lot of little actions that people can do. I have a nonprofit, americasfuture.net, you know, where you can become a champion for America and you can get involved in and one of the big things that we're involved in right now, which is a big project called Protect and Defend Our Children for Child Trafficking. I mean, so there's all these little options that you have. What people have to do is they have to decide what are they best suited for and then go do it. You can't sit at home anymore and go, I don't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm too busy. I don't have enough money. I can't, whatever. You know, I mean, you've got to get into the fight and you got to find what your new purpose in life is in order to save America. We have to expand our voices. And when we are all speaking together, using the same language and fighting back against this overtaking of this federal overtaking, this federal overreach of our government, we can actually win. And I think mm -hmm. that that's what, so my, that's my guidance to people is get fired up, get involved, take what local action means to you, interpret it, and then go out there and do something. Even if it means getting involved in a prayer group or changing the church. If you go to a church across the street from your house and you're not getting something out of it, go to a church across town. Go find mm -hmm. some place that's giving you positive reinforcement and providing you with ideas and actions that you can take locally. That's how we're going to, that's how we the people will win the day in this country and get our country back on track. I totally appreciate that. General Flynn, thank you so much for your time today. For people listening, where can they find out more about you? Where can they grab your book? And we just really appreciate you being here today. Well, they can go to uh, generalflynn.com. Generalflynn.com is my website. And I, we sell the book on my website. At uh, you, you can get an autograph copy. And there's also a, uh, you know, you don't have to get an autograph copy. You can go to my website, generalflynn.com, and it can take you to Amazon. Amazon, it's a bestseller, by the way. Amazon sells it $3 cheaper than uh, Barnes & Noble. I don't know why they're doing it, but uh, Barnes & Noble, it's actually a bestseller on Barnes & Noble. Uh, but uh, Amazon, you go there, it's $3 cheaper. But read it. It's meant for the kind of conversation that we had today, Jeremy, and it's meant to give people an idea about what to do next. So, you know, thanks for letting me, uh, you know, shamelessly push my book on this great broadcast of yours. Absolutely. Well, General Michael Flynn, Thank you so much for what you're doing for this country, and thank you so much for your time today, sir.